so Stefan, welcome again to this uh, session. Uh, so thank you for joining and thank you for uh, sharing with us uh, some uh, some some of the uh, learnings that you had during your journey. So uh, as a reminder, you had uh, celebrated your 100 days of audits <laughs> with EUMDR. So congratulations first for that. Uh, and uh, thank you for sharing all the outcomes. Um, when we are saying 100 days of audit, um, how many audit is this? Because it's not 100 audits, I suppose. So wow. how many audits? <laughs> in, that, in, that's a, the funny thing is for the smaller companies, they have one or two, maybe two or three days of audit. So okay. that's okay. So then you have smaller companies, but then you have also some big multi-site companies who have, okay, so it's, we have been three days at one site and we travel to the next ah, site. And then okay. we had, uh, for example, we had um, an one, um, one streak with 25 audit days in a row. So okay. completely no other things, 25 audit days, tap, 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 tap. That was okay. It was hard. And um, I'm very happy that, um, that our auditors have been very good. So um, it, it, because it's, ah, it's sometimes amazing and sometimes it is hell. Great. I, I imagine that. So let's let's talk about that maybe with some maybe anecdotes if you have. Um, so um, for the people that are on the on the on the chat, so don't hesitate to ask any questions. I will pick the question and we'll ask that to uh, to Stefan as usual. Uh, so we have Durai from India that has just joined us. Uh, Peter from Netherlands. Rene from Netherlands. So Rene, who I know very well because he was with me at the at the at the certification program. Uh, Liat from Israel. Uh, so hello, Liat. Um, so um, Stefan, uh, you sent me a presentation. I will share that with everybody. Let me do that. Here it is. Um, so let's go through it. Um, maybe for those that don't know you, let's make a small introduction, uh, and then um, yeah, we can uh, we can start after that. So yeah. your turn. Yes. Hello, I'm Stefan. Maybe some of you already know me. I am um, the CEO and a consultant, especially consultant for medical devices and medical device companies. And I have say I'm um, from one uh, from a few of the auditors for certain notified bodies. I got the names the regulatory rascal. So um, because I am very very well flexible in bending the regulations and the possibility that we can do with it. So, but that's pretty cool. We have a lot of fun. We have uh, with all the audits and I am a realist for regulations. We should not use regulation as, wow, what we have to achieve. It's not possible. We need to go to the point and say, okay, this is what we can do. Can we manage compliance with that? That is the, my important message, which I bring to all. And that's the same with the audits. Um, we have had pretty, pretty good auditors. We have pretty much fun with the auditors, especially when we get more into details with them and more into uh, good contact. So, but it's always it's a challenge to go, okay, how much compliance can you deliver? And yeah. what is the expectation? For example, I know um, I, I was in one, um, I heard a story from one okay. of my colleagues who told me, okay, um, uh, there was an FDA inspector, but no matter, it tells you, okay, look, this is what FDA expect. Okay. This is, is what I expect. And you are somewhere here. Ah, so, okay. <laughs> in that case, that is uh, the definition where we need to go. This is what the auditor expects. This is what you really have. This is what you think you have. And then okay. let's define where we are. That's realistic. That's and I'm very passionate on that. So that's what I thought. And yeah, I've made a few things from my friend, my findings, and uh, which we always had. You will always have findings. It's, you can yeah. do as much as you can uh, as you want. Yes, but there's no problem. If you have finding, solve it. Exactly. It's, when, it's, a, it's a way. It's a. It's a way for improvement. I think it's. Yeah. A, it's a way for improvement, and it's. Uh, usually, we are happy or when we get only minor findings because it's just a way for improvement. And uh, when we get major, then it's more critical. But when we have minor, it's a bit normal. But um, yeah, if you can have zero, it's better because you have nothing to do. But if you have some small ones, it's okay. I mean, we are. We are not. Uh, we are not making any problem with that. Yeah. Actually, having zero findings is a bit tricky because you think you have everything done well, but maybe your auditor was just sleepy. So uh, in that case, um, zero findings is something which I say will be hard to achieve, manageable, possible, yes. But 
suppose the best thing I think is you have one or two findings, minor nonconformities. You can fix them, you can solve that, and you know it was the details will have been sufficiently. So that was my impression on that, and that worked out in most cases quite well. Okay. So uh, what else uh, do you have here? Uh, Q-Pragmatist? Yeah, yes. Um, I'm very pragmatic when it goes about quality. There is a certain amount of resource and energy you can deliver into a system, into a product, into your quality management system. So use best possibility and look for compliance. Don't look for, I, I know many people who try to achieve 100%. I tell you, okay, yes, achieve what, try to achieve 100%, but be satisfied with 80. Exactly, yeah. And then take the 80 and that, so, okay, and now one step greater. And it's that's a, it's it. A, it's a journey, it's not like yeah. something that you can make perfect from the beginning, so it's a real journey. Yeah. And what is regulatory, Rascal? <laughs> yeah, that is, that is something what I, um, um, what I, one of the auditors gave me as a nickname, is that's a, uh, you know a Rascal? I think uh, I think I know this kind of animal, yeah. Yes, exactly. And that's what uh, he, he gave me as a name because that animal is, well, it's a very nice animal, nice looking, but um, it is very hard to tackle with. So yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's why he gave me that name. And I always try to find every kind of solution for my back client in my best possible way. And um, yeah, he even sometimes thinks that I don't care about the auditors in a same way he would like. Okay, okay. So it's great. So um, do uh, just one thing, maybe. Uh, did you had all your audits uh, uh, within uh, just one country, or you really moved uh, in many countries? Yes. Um, for one, uh, uh, for one company, we traveled to twelve worldwide sites and needed to go okay. anywhere as it was. Okay. Okay. One of the one of the hardest hardest times I ever had, but it was cool. Pretty cool, but it was very, very hard because we go day by day by day by day. And at the end, the auditors have been very happy to get rid of me, the same as I was getting rid of the auditors. So I can, I can imagine. Okay, so let's uh, go now to um, the these journeys and explain a bit uh, to the people what, what you learned from it and maybe what they can avoid or where they can improve uh, during their next audit. So... Um, here is the earth of the audit. So what do you mean here? Yeah, um, see, an MBR audit consists of two parts, the technical documentation review, the TD, and the audit itself. So stage one, stage two. Stage one, hey, easy fish. So take it, bring it to documentation. If you had in the past already an MDD or an ISO 1345, you adapted it well, okay, then, hey, that's quite easy. But on the uh, other what, hand, what, what, what are they reviewing again during the stage one? Is just documentation for quality management system. It's yes. uh, just yes. the, the basic things just to see that you have you are basic uh, all the basic information you have them. Yes, and check your quality management system against their specific characteristic for the MDR. So Article it's ten nine. 10.9 A to M. Yes, exactly. So in, in some other things, like for example, do you have an insurance policy? Okay. So you need to make sure that you have this because MDR requires you to have insurance policies. So they checked, do you have a sufficient insurance policy? So that was one of the things which is, in, for example, in Germany, quite heavy to get because um, most of the insurance companies, medical devices, oh no, we don't like, we can't remember 2012, haven't been a good year, so no. And so it was hard to get that, but feasible. And what I want so, to say so, is- so, so, so do you mean that uh, they are also checking that you have an insurance for yes. your company about that? They, they will look at the paper, they will look at the, at the uh, which, which uh, agency it is, that it's a, a good one, and it's, it's, it's really covering everything. You need a certificate for your insurance. Okay. That's what they so wanted to is, is there a specificity for this insurance or is it just a company insurance, any anything? Uh, it needs to be about product safety. Okay. And um yeah, and it's a product insurance. So um well specific, mm, yes, no. They have been placed if we get some of the paper with everything and that's Okay, so so yeah, it's just an administrative check. Then it's just yeah. looking that you have the paper and everything is fine. But it's good to know that it is part of their audit or the checklist of their audit. So just to to review that. Yeah. 
Yes, um, and, that, and that's very fu very, fu very funny because not all notified body check that. Okay. Yeah, it, it's, it, it is an it is that you need to have it is a new new feature of MDR which is very which is not very talked about because hey easy very uh, get an insurance pay that's it so but uh, some of the notified bodies looked at it directly and said yes yeah, this is needed for us so we need to make sure we have it and we need to need to make sure it's a notified body we need to check you have it. So okay. it should be in general in every audit procedure because it's easy to catch, but it is not done. It was not done in all of the procedures. Some notified bodies start, did some not. And okay. there's also the one thing which I call me here is a technical documentation because um, there is a, there's a six months deadline. There's a six months deadline between the technical documentation until the procedure is gone and you need to start over with your audit, especially for the first certification. Okay. So if you do not have the technical documentation prepared in advance and some notified bodies go the way like, okay, if this is your first certification, which for MDR always is, you need to deliver the technical documentation and the quality documentation that from the quality management system to ensure it will work together and your technical documentation can be checked content wise. Okay. So they are doing some um, off-site audits and on-site audit. Uh, they can do, I mean, they choose. It's not like uh, there is a kind of a, a rule for that. They can do whatever they want, but they decide with you, send me the file before and we do a, a audit uh, at the site, but we have an off-site audit for a technical file, or we can do, do, do that after. I mean, they, they, have, they, they will organize that with you, uh, yeah. but you have to be before for this. Uh, yeah. Just a quick question. Uh, so people were asking, is this insurance... Uh, for product liability insurance, so um, correct. it's correct. So is that uh, what is uh, Soren is asking? Is insurance just for manufacturer or also for importer and distributor? We hadn't, we haven't had it in an importers or in an distributors. Yeah, I, I don't think on the MDR it's talking specifically about this kind of economic operator. It's mainly the responsibility of the. Of the manufacturer, but um, the importer or distributor can be liable in case they are not respecting the the transport and storage condition of the products, etc. But out of that, it's really the responsibility of the manufacturer. So, is that, is but, that is uh, remember, just remember one thing: the 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 distributor and the importer are not audited by a notified body. So, correct. I, it's the competent authority then who is checking. So it's mainly if there is a question, it's a competent authority, but there is no specific requirements on the EU MDR uh, for that, from what I've seen. But uh, maybe so, somebody has. Yeah, for, to, so at least they, they need, don't need to check that my distributor has an insurance. That is not needed. However, in general, that's always a good thing. But I, yeah, yeah, it's. I mean, everybody should have an insurance in case. Yeah. But um, yes. uh, do you do you know by heart where it is located, which clause it is on the UMDR? I know there is one uh, for liability, but uh, cannot remember. It's it's the last one, nearly to the last chapters, if I remember well. But uh, I cannot I cannot remember this one. Um, actually, um, I cannot. I don't know the clause by heart. I will yeah. look at it and then I will give you the feedback where I can find when you can find great. it. Great, great. Thank you for that. Um, another question: Can you expand on the six months? What do you mean by uh, so? Uh, yeah. my, can you expand on the six months, uh, time window? So what? Do you mean? It is between the time when you um, when you go for um, from the technical documentation. They need um, they need to finish the audit frame from technical documentation stage one, stage two within six months. Ah, yeah, okay, okay. Months. And that, yeah. um, well, if it can be extended, <sighs> yes, it can be extended. It can be organized in a way so that it will work out very smooth, but um, negotiations. Yeah. Neg okay. Negotiation on that. But it's important that you have with your with your quality management system, a technical documentation that you can show, that you can prepare, okay, I've done it. Not I only talk about it, but I also have done it. Exactly, yeah. I mean, there is auditors that like also to look at those kind of documents and to see what is inside. And if it's really, uh, what is mentioned inside is really the reality of the outside. So so it's it's clear. Yes, and um, also, okay. uh, as you explained, um, there are a, a, a few possibilities. The easiest one is you stand in the technical documentation as well as stage one, and then do say it's a notified body does that within their office. The so second one is say to check the technical documentation during your, um, the first rough check. Okay, 
on in their office. The second one with the stage two on site in your facility, or the third one is um say uh, say you go to their facility and check the technical documentation. So it's especially then it's very useful if you have plenty of technical documentation scopes. Okay. Um, okay. So next one um, here <laughs> yeah. we we have uh, when we have to respond to the auditor. So uh, what is the kind of uh, strategy or step by step? That you are proposing for 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 the audit for 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 yeah. people that are, how to answer to them. Yes, um, <laughs> the more you talk with an auditor and the more you read from their findings, the more you get confused. So yeah. first thing is read your findings and read your response from the notified body, even if it's just a response for technical computation. Read it line by line, very carefully. Remark what you think it is. And then take it aside, sleep a night, take it in the morning, look at it again, you will find a different meaning. So okay. look at it carefully. And then if you know what you have understood from it, take a call to the auditor and ask him, okay, I understand that you have the following question. As you see how I um, speak with it, I do it the same way the auditor asks me during the audit. So, so okay, I understood that you are wants, you want the following thing for me. Is that correct? Simple, vice versa, the same conversation as ISO 19011 tells us. Yeah. So, okay, and then he tells you, yes, that's correct, or no, that is not correct. Send you, we adjust. Then I have everything included to know, okay, do I now need to issue a kappa or not? In many cases, if you're not certain, what do you want to do? Ask the auditor. You're still in the call. Ask the auditor, hey, okay, we can correct this. For example, few things on technical documentation, oh, damn, we didn't have that made correct, but it means the other thing. I'm very, very sorry that it's not the exact meanings that I have written, but hey, it's I understood that it's my definition of da -da 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 -da, and everything's fine and all good. And we just simply had a different meaning on it. Then no kappa needed. So we can discuss on that. But that's a very important decision. Do you want to need kappa or do you need a kappa or not? If you have a understanding that you need a kappa, hey, please, please be very precise. Correction, okay. corrective action, preventive action. Okay. Kappa. That's something which I see as an auditor very often completely wrong. That, yeah, I done, have done a corrective action without a correction or a preventive yeah. action without correction. Hey, ah, Kappa first trial. So easy. Take so, it. Just, so we have made also a LinkedIn Live uh, two weeks ago or yes. three weeks ago about Kappa. Uh, so don't hesitate to go back to it. We really looked at all the steps of creating a Kappa from beginning to the end, uh, even with the effectiveness monitoring, with the corrective action, preventive action, etc. So I think uh, if you want a reminder, a free reminder, go to the uh, YouTube channel and you'll find a video with Karandi Badwal where we talked about uh, about Kappa. But uh, yeah, uh, Kappa is not only when when you have also a problem in, in the in the facility it's also when you have an audit and you have some non-conformities, you have also to open some capas because it's a problem, so you have to solve it. So, uh, so many, this is the point here. Definitely, yeah. And in some cases, you can avoid a capa and say, okay, correction, it's fine. That's also sometimes possible, but you need to be sure about it. And then next thing is because you need to deliver fast. You need to deliver it for the auditor quite fast in a certain time frame, mostly so two to four weeks to tell him, okay, I've done everything. I closed every, I, I looked at everything. Everything is fine. And I have a clear Kappa and a good strategy. What I want to do next. And then okay. that strategy needs to be very, very tight. For example, I had in a few days ago, I had information about, okay, um, well, your policy for significant change was not sufficiently. And the auditee responded with, yeah, okay, we will do that next year. In okay. the, during the, during the, um, so it's the annual uh, rework of the QMS. What the hell? Significant change. Okay. If it works in one year. It does not fit the purpose. The purpose exactly. is, hey, because what happens? What happens? The company says, yes, we only need to apply it next year. So we have this year, we have the possibility to go significant changes without noticing. Okay. That does not work. That does simply not work. So in that case, clear, quick, clear, 
and define a strategy and then pile evidence. So send all documented evidences you need and send them to the auditor in a quick information, okay, what you have done. Make a small, for each document which you have changed, give it an example, make a small rational. I did the following thing. You can look on page 25. This is a new information, da, 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 to give him evidence. You know, your auditor will love you for that because you pointed him exactly where he needs to go. For those who respond to US FDA, how do you do that? You go and say, okay, I changed my document in the following thing, in the following way, I changed it on to page 27 in that section, I added this and this information, I give you that information. For the US FDA, you do that every day, all time. And for the European auditors, you tell, ah, nah, I will do it. here, this is a document, just take it and we will go free for that. That's all fine. So the, no. The only, thing, the, the only thing is also that the fact in the US FDA, there is one agency, so there is one process to do that. Uh, within the notified bodies, it's also sometimes, yeah, there is some differences sometimes. So it makes it a bit difficult when you go from one to the other. M yes, most companies have less than two notified bodies. And only a small company uh, and only a few companies have more than 10 notified bodies. So in that case, hey, you this is a variation you will have is once you, got, once you get step two, take a call, you know how he wants all the other steps. Yeah, That's true. Information, I've... call, get it. And I think I, I think what is important here is also the, the, the communication with the, the notified body is really important that you have just really to as you said take a call uh, call them ask them uh, what they what what they think or what what you think if they, it's correct that there is no misunderstanding because if next year they come and they find the same issue because there was a misunderstanding maybe they, well, it can be also a, a big problem here. Yeah. Okay, um, next step after that is. Um, the claims. Yeah. So this is kind of the basic things that we have to have at the beginning when we are looking at a medical device. So uh, what are the claims, the intended use, intended purpose, indication for use? Um, and we talked about that, I think, during an, a previous uh, previous live also, how yeah. we should do that. We, we have we have talked about that with, um, uh, with Cesare Magri also uh, from Beyond Clinical. Uh, but yeah, I think it's, uh, it's kind of the basis for any medical device to have that. Yes, and that foundation is in many cases very weak. Okay. It's like you you try to build a house on sand. Might work. It's not very reliable. So in that case, you and I have, I have found out that you found a, a very good audit pitfall. So claim and intended purpose is not detailed. So look into this that slide and take everything. Claim. Your device has a claim. It has a claim. Some companies try to give me, yeah, it's a very generic claim. It goes on the complete product group and family. And they want to try to tell me that my product does not have a claim. So, okay. So all products of you together build one system and that system has a claim. No, the product have a claim, but it's a family claim. So the yep. product has a claim. Yes, the family claim. Okay, the product has not a family claim, but the family's claim. So it has a claim. And that is something which needs to be done. It needs to be insured and brought into documentation. Same like intended use, patient population. You know, it's quite easy to follow this kind of information listed in a table. If you look at it, that's nothing, no rocket science, but it will confuse the auditor or your technical documentation assessor, and it will confuse your certification body because they need to file the certificate. So they will look into all of that and say, this is my product you, you have to deliver and this not. So very precise, very clear on what is your content on it. And um, so the, what are they asking usually is that uh, they are looking at the technical file and they are asking questions about the claim or intended use, or they are asking directly, what is your claim? And the people have to, yeah. to kind of really clearly say that my claim is this and that. Definitely. So in, I've, um, I've seen it on forms for, for the, in plenty of the audits. It's a, the auditor who has a bit of the technical experience about the product asks you, okay, tell me, what are you claiming? Okay. So, okay, okay, I claim this, this, and that. And then he goes to marketing. A few hours later and says, okay, you claim different thing. What do you want to, what do you want to explain me to have your claims? And then 
once that's full is hooked and hands in, he asks, okay, show me your technical documentation, show me your clinical, because he has the marketing flyer already. And then he yeah. goes, okay, is that equal? If it's not equal, it's not the same. So this is this is one of the most dangerous thing that is happening here. What we are talking about now uh, is the fact that um, if you are if on your quality management system you have no process to review all the marketing material that is uh, sent before it's released on the market, uh, it can be really dangerous because I, I I mean there is marketing people are really creative and sometimes mm -hmm. they are using some vocabulary that maybe they think is suitable. But uh, if you give that to a regulatory affairs person, they say no, you cannot say that because then we'll have some confusion with this part of the MDR or this part of the regulation. So it's it's better if you have this kind of process uh, to review the marketing material, to have also a kind of a, a ID number with a version, with a clearance number or anything that is showing that this document is really cleared and can be released on the market, which is something that a lot of companies are missing here. Yes. And without that, you the complete system between claims, clinical, marketing, all that will fail if you do not understand and have a common understanding of the minimum points. For example, for marketing, what I always use is um, all of your IT guys can prepare you a gimbal, HTML, JavaScript, website, whatever, which tells you, okay, I have the following product. Look into it. That is my CEP. In my CEP, the most of the things are listed. And then I remove all the words which are common like and a device blah 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 and then um, i use my marketing material again as against it to do the same and if then their keywords are used on the one side which are not on the other side it's failed your it guys can do that within minutes to write such kind of um, program it is around 60 or 80 lines long so easy and so, so so it's something that is really important that also we have consistency between each of the documents that what you are saying on your risk management on technical file and clinical evaluation on on your marketing material all the wording and vocabulary should be the same and here it can be one of the pitfalls. it's uh, about the claims but also the consistency between each of the material Definitely, because it leads you from the first one to the second, because it from claims, it leads to the clinical. Clinical, we always have few things about the pitfalls, about it, what is the complete content of that, of that um, the clinical evaluation, what needs to be included, how it is been written. Yeah, quite easy, write it in a way everyone can understand it. Use given information from the MDR annexes. You will see information which is there to make it easy for the auditor to read. You know, the auditor has a very tight, really tight schedule. The same as the technical reviewer has, the SSO. And so they want to look at it, present it. That's, that's what the way why FDA has a structured information about the 510K to yeah. make it easy for the reviewer, not for you as manufacturer, but for the reviewer. And the reviewer needs to go very fast to it, dum, 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 understood, 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 fail. So, and that's the same what, um, um, what you have with your, um, uh, with your notified body. They need to ensure that you have a very small and easy approach through all what you here see, through all of the annexes required from what is your classification, your CSPRs, technical documentation things, stock postmark surveillance documentations, and how you do UDIs, C, uh, and the science QC, all of that. So it needs to be in a very easy, structured way, and the your way you go is Annex 2. That is your friend. In that friend, you have a list what you can use. You can use STAT or something as well. You can also use the containment of the 510K. Just make sure to have everything included in your um, in your technical documentation, which is required. But you can use a different format. That's fine. All notified bodies have in, until now, except that it's not the format that is uh, NX2, if you have a reason. If you use, for example, IMDR STAT, it has a different structure. It's fine for them but you need to have everything included. Also, if you use it from the 510K and use the information, also fine if you have a clear structure and everything included. But um, in case you have a weird ball of documentation, a little, well, how's it, um, a little, uh, yeah. A little bag, a bag full of documentation where no one knows what is a clear structure, what's information, 
you can be sure said your reviewer is annoyed after one hour of reading. Yeah, I can I, I, I confirm that, and it's why it's why I think they created that now with the MDR with this structure Annex Two and Annex Three, as you mentioned here. Um, it was not really um, in in the MDD. It was more a list. Here is the list of uh, things, but there was no kind of structure. Here it says no in Annex Two. I need to see that that in this chapter that that in that chapter etc. And in Annex Three, I need to see all the post marketing servants everything. And the difference is before on the MDD, um, you needed to just make a reference. You can you can make a reference to some documents uh, to have them uh, on the technical file. But now with the te new technical documentation, uh, it says you have to include them inside. So. Uh, what I'm advising usually is to put the reference maybe in the main part of the document, but to put the documents, full documents in the annex uh, when the auditor can review it. And I think it's, it makes the life of the auditor really easy because then he will review the, the information. He will arrive to a point and say, oh, the document is in annex, so I will go in annex instead of calling you again. Oh, I need also to see this document. I need to receive yeah. this one, I need, et cetera. So the idea here is that they have the full package and that they can review everything without having to call you again or to ask you again or this or that, which makes also some, some time, uh, time uh, consuming for, for that. So, um, is uh, so this is also one of the pitfalls that you've seen within the 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 different audits that you had. Yes, you get a you get a stack of documents. So unclear structured. You get simply a stack of documents. Okay, for a device you have three thousand pages of doc technical documentation. Okay, tell me. As an auditor, how can I read the uh, relevant information from it within eight hours or 12 hours or 16 or 24? That's the time I have for your technical documentation review. So in that case, I am completely, I'm completely out of order if I get simply get it on a stack without a clear informational structure. That's why you should do that. And with an, it's also easier for you. Be sure. I also know I know the manufacturer side very well, and I always try to defend it on that case that you have a weird or some not a very ideal structure. I understood that, but then you have different, yeah. How the how I can call it? Then you have different approaches. How it you can make sure that everything's under a good shape if you can make it short to the auditor that he has a clear way through your documentation. He has a very good thinking about you, what it will, um, how it will help you and how is how the, how the doc documentation is built. And the better you build it in the structure, the more he's convinced that you have a good quality management system to build in on your on your complete uh, complete company, and that's why you need it. And well, um, yeah, if you do not have a clear structure, the auditor has a hell of work, and he is very very unhappy. If the auditor is unhappy, you will be unhappy. That's quite easy. It's a very easy one. It's a one directional communication from the auditor to you. You deliver. Just the documentation that he delivers his mood or her mood directly back to you about the documentation. In case it's not clear, it's not easy to understand, he will say, uh, didn't found it, fail, didn't found it, fail, <laughs> didn't found it, fail. And yeah, really. <laughs> That's clear. It's it's exactly that. So if you don't help him, it will, will not help you at all. So it's, yeah. it's more like that. Uh, we have we have a question. We have a question from, from Liat who is asking, how is the communication with the notified body? Do you get quick answer, do they assist? So is there a kind of uh, a good response time or it's something that like uh, you ask a question now and they answer in two in two months or one, one week or two weeks? Uh? I will shift that question back to one of the other slides. Okay, so let's- uh, But I, I will definitely answer it. Okay, so let's move then. Okay, risk and benefit. Yeah. So this is one of the biggest uh, thing that we are talking. A lot, I mean, we were talking a lot about that risk benefit. So this was also a challenge during your audits. Yeah. Yes. How do you calculate benefit against risks? You have an yeah. You have plenty of informations. There are guidance documents how you can do that, and there's also a technical report on the risk management process. On there's a technical report is a. TR24971, 
which is at least in this case very valuable it tells you okay how can you have a life cycle calculation again um, the life cycle risk against the benefit and in there is one thing there's one thing which i always have with the documentations it is okay you have benefit tell me how is your benefit influ impacted and influenced by user accepted does the user acceptance reduce your benefit yes and no or no and how you can challenge this by clinical data so one of the pitfalls was there's no relation between there was no relation between the risk benefit analysis done in the ce uh, in the in, in the risk management report against the cer which gives you the literature so and then there's a big catch because it's also other way around you need to reference the risk benefit in the cer so you send you get into the hen and the egg problem to say okay where do you do, where do you do that so simple answer cd is a clinical evaluation plan literature search literature search protocols gives you your information about what might be the benefit for your device then okay. you go to the risk analysis risk management da -da 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 -da, i have everything you reference your literature search protocols your literature informations tell them okay this is what i have in literature this is my information i use in in my um, risk analysis and tell them this is my calculation then i make a few well on a few risks you simply will have easy sentences like yeah with the, with the device it is better than without look at the literature because um when you use it you have a likelihood of surviving with 95 percent if you don't have it you have 50. okay so, okay yeah it does not challenge already the user acceptance because you don't you have to use okay yes literature tells me that procedure is good but literature does not tell me is it used good so Grab your usage data from other devices, US mode database, for example, or any kind of recall databases or any kind of complaint data. Take that also into your risk benefits. That's part of it. Then you get through that. You can have a good calculation, the risk benefit on the risk management side. So risk management report gives you a final that's your that's it. And then deliver it back to your clinical evaluation report and tell here okay you've done it you looked at it it was good it was your risk benefit was clear so yes fine go back into all the um they go back as uh, we can tell in the cer everything's good that's something which happens from my perspective to less so okay you go in the risk analysis you need to and uh, you use literature in the cer you need to use risk and is, is, is there, was there during those 100 days of audits, was there some consistency in terms of the what the auditor was looking at, what he was searching? Was there kind of a path on this? Yeah. Say, so looked at least, said it is in both ways referenced. Okay. So they are so, really checking the board document, checking that it's, uh, it's really linking one to the other. Yeah. Yes. That was a, it's a, a simple thing that it just looked for the reference. We had a few procedures where they directly looked into it and tell me okay how you calculated it ah, how okay. you calculate benefit it's pretty okay. cool you can calculate benefit in uh, if you use user acceptance and clinical and then you can have a benefit you can make it on this on the um uh scale with specific personal um, usage groups and all of that you can divide that and then you have a specific benefit calculation on user groups you can combine them also into one one bag that's also fine into one um one little um yeah uh, package and so this is my clinical user acceptance my clinical user benefit and this is my risks and then I, you can go okay if you have this likelihood of risk on a specific part and that's also a very good thing most devices have more than one use for example okay. if you look into the if you look into a patient monitor a patient monitor has different applicational parts if you yeah. have and that's one thing if you have different applicational parts you have different risk benefits yeah so for, you have to uh, make to check to take each features of your device and for each features yeah. if they are not connected specifically you have to evaluate the risk benefit for each of them and tell why this is fine or why this is uh, this yes. is not uh, not working correctly yeah. okay no, I think it's, uh... 
one of the biggest things, for example, if you have an automated defibrillator. Yeah. Remember, automated defibrillator is a class three device now. Yeah. So in that case, oh, you have an many of them are currently have more information about they can do some kind of monitoring. Then you have a monitor for professional use and you have the defibrillator for the auto, for the uh, layman use. So different acceptance. So tell me the acceptance of a defibrillator in the uh, common world. There is a calculation available. So you know, this is my bottom line of, of, um, of user um, acceptance and user usage. This is my, then you have the bottom line of this is my window when it helps people. And that is my benefit. And from that, I have my risk, which tells me, oh, it happens that it, fa- it does not work in this in this case, divide, and then you get on one bottom line and that is your risk benefit. Okay. And this one needs to go into the CR. Yeah, um, and and this is I think it's an important uh, message here because uh, risk benefit was always a challenge for some people to understand how to write that, how to do that. So uh, as you mentioned, there is some guidance. There is uh, the ISO TR twenty four nine seven one, which just was released I think two one or two weeks ago. So uh, something to to look at uh, because yeah, when you are looking at when, when you are reading the fourteen nine seven one, the risk uh, risk management uh, process uh, ISO. Uh, when you arrive to risk benefit, they say if you want to evaluate that, you have to go to the ISO TR uh, 24971, which was like <laughs> what I'm doing now. <laughs> I have the document, but I cannot do anything with that without looking at the, the other things. So now you can, and it can, I hope, help you for, for that. Um, okay, so next one is the clinical evaluation, plan, clinical evaluation report, PMCF plan, PMCF evaluation uh, report. So uh, the big combo. <laughs> yes, this is one of the, the things I really like. Okay, you have a clinical evaluation plan, you have a clinical evaluation report. We had a few companies who tried to put that into one document. Okay. It can't work. Auditors really dislike that. Okay. It was with the old MEDEF. It was a very, um, using the stage approach, it was a very easy thing. But now it's definitely, hey, go planning, hey, go evaluation, and go, go reporting. So do not do it in one report. That was one of the things which I was, yeah, which has been marked I, up every time it happened. I, I had I had this issue, but uh, with the notified body, but it was for MDD. They were saying to me, oh, I want a CEP uh, um, uh, separated from the CER. And I said, there is nothing that is, I'm not obliged to do that. I'm, I'm, it's okay for MDR, but I'm still under MDD. So, but they were asking, oh, yes, but uh, it's something that you get good practice or this or that. I said, yes, but uh, I mean, uh, let's wait for the MDR to make it like a, a normal practice and not for under MDD. But at the end, we were able to solve that. But it was also a challenge uh, at one point to say, okay, we have to separate documents. So you have to rebuild two documents instead of one, which was a, b- a bit of a, of a problem. But yeah, here, uh, creating a CEP first and then creating a CER after. So having two references uh, is uh, one thing. Um, it's, uh, it, uh, it's something that uh people um have also to understand it's a chronological document so you have the cp first you are waiting or doing the thing and then you create the cr so there is some gaps in terms of dates don't put the same date <laughs> for the same the two documents <laughs> exactly and if you um if you look into this is as a drawing in here so there's one thing which i always want to point out um it is yeah, it is for um, uh, within the sentence of our all rock star of quality, Deming, plan, do, check, act. You exactly. can use it, plan your clinical evaluation. Okay, then plan, then do clinical evaluation report, write your report. Then check, do I have everything? Yes. If no, make a PMCF plan. And then, yes, act, create a PMCF evaluation report. And that is one thing. Yeah, first divide the documents. That's easy to be done and helps you to avoid common mistakes. Second thing is if you say in your device description or in your clinical evaluation report and you tell them, yeah, you need to do PMCF, mean PMCF. Yeah, what is it? <laughs> yes, it's post market clinical follow up. And there's one very, very mean word, and that's called clinical. So it's um, in, in, with the MEDEF guidance 212, it was called post-market clinical follow-up studies. And yeah. that is key to keep in mind. It is 
talking about additional study material and additional study information. So how do you get that? Yeah, you need a study information study contract, ethic, whatever you need, you need a study protocol. That's what you have to finish up with your PMCF evaluation report at the end. So what I have seen is that many companies use, yeah, okay, we didn't get everything out of the new ZER. We made a CEP and they said it's a very, very strange thing. We have an existing product. We created a CEP evaluation plan, fine. Then we created a clinical evaluation report and found out we need a PMCF. What? Cannot be. It is an existing product. You had everything already or you had a problem in the past. So um, if you have sent your clinical your PMCF plan and said, yeah, you need something, the auditor will just go up and tell you, okay, what happens here? It's exactly. easy, easy. It's easy to find. And what was meant was PMS. Ah, okay. So it was really uh, a confusion in terms of vocabulary. So yes. we are not talking about PMCF, but PMS. Okay. Yeah. And that's pretty clear. Be clear that PMCF is different than PMS. PMS is, yeah, you can get data. Yes. PMCF is study protocol. You need exactly. to do more action. That is the difference. And that is something. And I've seen that con PMCF confusion in the audits. I've seen plenty of the ways. And also in the preparation from manufacturers, which we have prepared to the audits, we also have seen that by checking up the documentation. I don't know. So it's no PMCF. Yeah, it's a PMCF. Okay, but, but, but it's, 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 it's it's not a good it's not a good sign for an auditor when somebody is confusing, uh, making some confusion in terms of PMCF right. or PMS or, yeah. or other things. So it's a, it's a bit of a problem also. Yes, if you have the understanding of the terms, you don't make a problem. But you need to understand the terms, and that is something that you show your auditor. Okay, I understand where I, about what I'm talking about. So that's important. And the auditor has a problem with the mix up. They always have problems. You can combine the clinical evaluation plan with a PMCF plan if you have a stage approach. It might be you can combine the evaluation, clinical evaluation report, and um, it's afterwards with your PMCF reports, you can say you have stages. That's possible. Do not plan, uh, do not combine plan and report into one, and do not combine all of them into one. Build yeah. And yeah, that's one that thing. Yeah, by that, understand what is meant by the terms, then you get forward with it on a quite good level. No, I think it's it's a it's a good point here. So uh, having a, a good understanding of the different uh, tools, uh, having a good understanding of the different terms also that they are that we are using. Uh, I think the auditor is also asking for training on on UMDR so that people are really having a kind of. A, an understanding of that. So if you, if you are showing a training, but at the end you are not able to explain uh, all those systems, it can make say that mainly say that maybe your training was not really well done, or or yeah, it's, it can be a problem. So um, okay, so this was a pitfall then. Um, yeah. And, and oh, the CR yeah. we have a declaration of interest. Yes, that's something what happens also very often that you don't have the declaration of interest for the CR in a good detailed way. Explain it. It does not need to be perfect. 80% is sufficient. So look through it, make sure that you have at least one declaration of interest, which is fine. And it finds that it's not on this ready on purpose. That the person wants the CER to get through it. Yeah. What, what is, what was a very, very good thing? Oh, well, for me, it was a very good thing as a consultant. Um, because, because, uh, um, Many of the, um, the auditors have been very relaxed if the CER was written by an external consultant. Yeah. He is, well, he is very interested in the money he gets for, but he's not interested in the success of the product. Exactly. So he can write exactly. what he wants. He just killed, killed the stats of the bill. So in that, they are very relaxed, which was fun for me as a consultant. But um, internally, if you have a small company with just two people, it's quite, it, for a very small thing, it's very hard to get it. I understand that it can be written in a good way. Yeah. 
No, I think it's important. This uh, this will be really um, looked at. Uh, yeah. The evaluator or qual qualification also. Uh, so each time I have to provide my CV, I have to provide the declaration of interest. Yes. I have to explain why, as you've said, why I have no interest for me that it win or it lose. It's not uh, it's not my problem. The, the objective is the fact that you are getting uh, getting from the CR, uh, which is really I think I think important uh, important for you. Okay, um, great. Um, do we have a last one or no? Yes, there should be one. The, yeah, yes. The and positive outcome. Yes, and that is what there I. Is not, so there is no not only bad things when you had during your audit. There was also good things. <laughs> Actually, there have been very, very much good things, and that's one of the things when I go on communication with a notified body. To my understanding, the communication with a notified body was better. Okay. Send the path, and it was faster. So we had um, we we had a few of the um, uh, of the discussions where it has been okay. Within you get your result from the technical documentation within within two two weeks. We said okay, two weeks fine for me. For one of them, we said okay, I go down to your I drive to your office and sit down with you the next three days to look into it. Okay, no worry. Do that. Then he looked over it. Fine, fine, fine. After three days, we had everything finished. So that's also some things which have been possible and have been very good. Where I personally think that MDR is better than MDD. With MDD, they did not like to have this kind of discussions. That was not so good because that's also one thing you can with MDR. You can set the facts. Okay. We're still all everyone is still in MDR preparation or MDR first knowledge findings and first assumptions so everyone can make the fact you can build the facts that i want to i did it that way that is correct and then the other one must come and say okay no this and then it leads you to discussion and discussion leads you to deviation clearing so in that case you can f have different understandings different views which makes it better to go the way to say okay all the good that was a good positive outcome. What I've also seen on specifically on the manufacturer side was the clinical evaluation have been much better than the past. Yeah. So when I look into it, I'm not a clinical expert. That's one thing. But what I can do is read structures. I can yeah. look into the document and tell you, okay, all the headlines are available so I can pass it to my reviewer. That's what I can so, do. And that is easier now with MDR and better. It was always good in all the other times and it has been much fun. And this is also one thing which I found very, very interesting with the notified body in the discussion that they are, there is a guidance for significant change, what it means. However, everyone is still in the position to define for it themselves what they mean with significant change. So even when it said, yeah, when you look into the, the flowchart for significant change, every software change will directly lead to significant change. That's not meant. That's yeah. not meant with it. You need no. to negotiate with your notified body what is your significant change, what is the needed amount of significant change, and where you say, hey, until I do not cross that line, all is fine. We can do internal fi fixes. We can do internal um, new um, structures. We will not. We will guarantee to you in your some significant change paper that we will not guarantee with um, the, that we uh, impact the architecture, the risk file, and whatever, and the intended purpose until that. And then we will would be fine that it's not a significant change. They have been the bodies have been better in the discussion than the guidance document itself. So fine for that. And I'm very thankful to the notified parties as they go in many cases that way, because that will lead us to innovation. And the other yeah. thing, post-market surveillance and trending. Yeah. It's something which the notified body checks in the past with, yeah, it's okay. There is a bit of post-market surveillance. Now they go into that and say, so, okay, post-market surveillance and trending is required because a trend can be a non-conformity or a problem. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Definitely. And this is something which you, as a normal person, have always in mind. That if you walk the line in a steady way, you get in a trend, and sometimes you sometimes you will cross the border, and then you have a problem. And that is something in which you need to anticipate. That's what the MDR wants, and takes you into the information. This is your need. And with that need, um, you need to define it. So notified bodies have been quite easy in saying, okay, what is meant by you with a trend? 
So, okay. Exactly. I, I, think, I, think, I think this is also a good discussion because uh, a trend for a certain company is different than a trend for maybe another company. So first defining the trend is, is really a, a good thing yeah. to do on your quality management system. For example, one, uh, on my, one of my company, it was like, if you had three times within the same period, three uh, issues, which are the <laughs> same issues, then it's a trend. Uh, if you have, uh, in comparison to last, uh, last period, you have a 10% increase of the issues, then it's a trend, etc. So you define what is a trend, and then the auditor will check this against yeah. what you already defined. So it's also something important, but you have to define that. You cannot just say a trend is a trend because, uh, as I said, it's different for everybody. So yeah, and it's a different thing if you build, for example, you build a um, um, ZT or an MR device where you sell once a once a week, and on the exactly. other hand, you sell millions of um, syringes a day. So it's a difference. And say, well, it's a difference in criticality, a difference in volume. Maybe it's the same amount of money at the end of the day, but it's a different volume of devices. And so you need to be sure that you have set up the trend for your device, not for your company, for your device. And you can need, you need a threshold when you say, okay, pass this trend, Kappa, pass this trend reporting. That needs to be exactly. done. And, and send the procedure get, for that, yeah. Yeah, and then you get by automatic into the good post-market surveillance system and post-market surveillance system. We always claim about, yeah, you need to do active post-market surveillance. Yes, active post-market surveillance needs, you need to trigger action. It does not need to tell you, yes, call everyone once a week. It's not, it's also active post-market surveillance, but that's not meant. You need to trigger active from your side, not wait for a problem. That's a difference. But 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 are they are they checking this kind of thing, the proactivity of those companies uh, to make yeah. some surveys, to make some to create some literatures, to make some uh, databases in hospital registries in hospital, etc. Are they looking at that? Yes, they look at it. They look into it. For example, do you have an active postbox surveillance? Yes. Okay. How have you do it? For example, surveys. How example, if you have a software product, app store calculations, um, revenue reviews and something like that. So it's all active. I trigger it. I want it. It's not, I have the other one has a problem and tells me he has a problem. That's not active. And the active one is I want information. And that's what I try to figure out. I can do it with surveys. I can do it with, with surveys. Please, please be very careful. If you do, if you write a survey in the wrong way, it's a study. If it you might, write a survey in a wrong way, wrong way it is used as a, yeah, it can be used as a patient study. Okay. If, for example, in Germany, so there's a very good, um, very high likelihood. So if I write a study, okay, did this tool have this, did this product, this software help you with your disease? That's so a study. Okay. You need to. You, you, and then it's it's need to be reported in advance to the uh, to the authorities. No problem. They say yeah, it's fine. But you need to be aware of this kind that can happen. And okay. so, in, but you need to prepare what is your active phrase in your post market surveillance system. Okay. And hey, you can do that. Yeah, we can do that. <laughs> That's for something what I've all what I have had in all the audits. We had a very good understanding at the end with all the auditors. Yes, there have been findings. Yes, it is as it is. You cannot do everything perfect. Sometimes you have different understandings. Sometimes you have different situations where you don't think that's a good idea and the auditor thinks it is a good idea. But you can always go to that and say, okay, let's discuss. Let's go into it. And that was something which has been, from my perspective, has been very, very good because the auditors, to my understanding and to my experience, have been better qualified for MDRs than for MDD. Okay. I think, I think, we, I think we, talk, we, talk, we, we talked a lot about MDR since now two, three years. So I think uh, there was really a, a lot of things that, uh, that people had to, to learn from, uh, which is, I think, a good thing. Um, uh, do you think that... Um, also, the fact that there was uh, this uh, increase in terms of uh, qualification of the notified bodies to be MDR uh, it was one thing that made that those auditors are now may maybe more qualified or uh, have a better understanding of what are the requirements. Definitely. The more you know about a particular requirement, the more you understand how it will be used in a specific context. Okay. And then, for example, if you look into five or three companies day after day, which are 
in the size of let's let's call it um, ten thousand of people with employees who work on it, who work on big products. And then on the six, your six assessment will be a small company with five people, a software product that there is no risk. You need to adapt. You need yeah, to adapt. true. And therefore, you, if, you're, if you are trained on your workload basics, your MDR, if you're trained good and well and very well and again and again and again, you can compensate faster to bring the levels what the company needs and that is what i have seen and until now all the auditors i had have been very 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 good no, i think it's good it's a, it's a good outcome because i think uh, it's also to say to the to the manufacturers that uh, the auditors will be fair with you they will understand your situation they will really uh, listen to you and provide you really the right uh, the right uh, amount of uh, of investigation related to your product which is uh, something really uh, really important um okay i have a, there is a last question uh, regarding uh, aza Chaudhry, who is asking how is the conformity assessment route affected by packaging your device with the CE marked accessory, which is a third party product. So, are we talking here about um, uh, procedure pack or, or it's uh, no, 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 it's a, it's a simple, it's a product from your company with a third party product from another company, I suppose. Well, that definitely depends how you package it, yeah. how you um, do that together if you call packages in one combined procedure pack or a system, that is one thing, which will be possible, then you have article 22 to look yep. at, then, um, okay, that is one thing, and then it's quite easy, it will not impact your conformity assessment route first, and maybe in the system, if it's a C-marked device, which has good clearance, that's all fine, non ce marked device, you need to have a new conformity assessment. Yeah. So that is new for MDR instead of MDD. MDD means, at least for the rest of Europe outside of Germany, we had a lawsuit on that. Um, means CE mark only medical CE mark on the MDR it means all CE mark devices. So MCCE, whatever white should see maybe all kind of CE marking. Yeah, which yeah so a toy or camera or whatever. Yeah, <laughs> yes. yes, and uh, that is one thing. But, and there is one thing, if you co-package your, or if you package your uh, third-party accessory into something which you are have as a critical procedure, for example, sterile, then you will need to change your conformity assessment route and do and um, include the third party product into it. So I'm very sorry that I cannot answer it directly without more context. If you give me context, I will answer it in full. Yeah, so here is the information from uh, Stefan Bollinger, so the phone and email if you want to, to look at that and uh, contact him directly. And you can contact him directly also on LinkedIn. Mm -hmm. uh, so check Beyond Quality and uh, and you will find you will find him. Okay, so um, uh, Stefan, um, I will offer this uh, slide deck for download uh, next week. So next week there will be the replay, uh, and I will send that on my YouTube channel. So please don't hesitate to go to the YouTube channel and and subscribe, and you will get a notification as soon as uh, this will be um, online. And then you will be there will be a link there, so you can download directly the, the the presentation if you want to get some more information, or if you want also to maybe train other people about what kind of what kind of outcome there will be regarding the, the medical uh, the medical device audits and uh, if you have any question you can go back directly to uh, stefan bolanger okay yeah, so just give me a call or a linkedin message i will nearly answer everything try to great. okay so thank you for all the people that were joining us uh, live uh, and uh, yeah uh, thank you stefan for uh, for all the information that you provided so let's look now at the 200 days of audits maybe <laughs> <laughs> so that we can see that yeah what if if the outcomes are the same if there is some some new trends here okay yeah. so thank you everybody and i wish you all a nice weekend thank you goodbye Bye.